Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate wickedly smart women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom, along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today we welcome our special guest, Stacy McGovern. Stacy went from outside salesperson to running a multi-million dollar company overnight. The wife of a police officer, Stacy's passion for helping families of law enforcement became her business. She launched her company Point Blank Safety Services in 2012 with no way of knowing today her company would be one of the most successful traffic safety and security companies in Texas. She then used that success to pay it forward by founding a nonprofit, Blue Family Fund, that provides scholarships to first responder dependents and financial aid to families of injured or fallen law enforcement officers. Stacy is not just the CEO and founder of these businesses, but is also a best-selling author, entrepreneur, and motivational speaker. And she contributed chapter 15 to our number one new release, internationally best-selling book, Wickedly Smart Women, Trusting Intuition, Taking Action, and Transforming Worlds. Welcome to the show, Stacy. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am so excited that you're here. So I want to start our time together today, Stacey, talking a little bit about your background and what inspired you to to start your own business first. Okay. Yeah. I've, well, I am the daughter of entrepreneurs, come from a, a large family of entrepreneurs, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, my mom, and you know, my mom, I call the original badass, if you will, because She ran five retail clothing stores my whole life and she opened them when I was five months old and she left every day in the morning before 7 a.m., came home every night after 6 p.m. And I never remember eating takeout, not once. So, yeah. So I refer to her, her, you know, her example a lot, but I have opened multiple businesses over my life but they weren't all successful. Mm-hmm. You know, I learned a lot because I consider every failure, you know, a learning, a learning experience, but never had the success that I finally did in, in 2014 when Point Blank Safety took off. So just learned a lot of entrepreneurship by example. You know, my mom was also the, you know, college wasn't optional in my family. So <laughs> went and, and got a degree and then immediately started trying to figure out, you know, what business I was going to be in. Mm, All right. Well, so you have deep roots in entrepreneurship and you mentioned two things that I want our listeners to hear. Number one is that you've had a lot of failures. Mm -hmm. And number two, the other thing that they may not have heard is that you started Point Blank Safety in 2012 and it wasn't until 2014 that things happened. So I think the the next question I want to ask you is if you could share a lesson learned from maybe one of your most epic failures. Why don't you share an epic failure and what you learned from that? And then we'll talk about that two-year gap between 2012 and 2014. Sure. I mean, when I I graduated college in tw- at 22 and I opened my first business at 24 years old and it was a lingerie store in my hometown. You know, like I said, my mom was in retail. My grandparents were in retail my aunts and uncles were in retail. So I just assumed as any 24 year old would, that I would be great at it (laughs) and that I would not need any help or, or, or not be humble enough to ask for help. And, you know, it it totally failed, you know, Victoria's Secret launched in every shopping mall across America and they could sell it for what I could buy it for. And I was too stubborn and too young and egotistical to, you know, step back and and try to get some help and try to figure out how to make it work. So it was, it was a massive failure. I mean, 
you know, I ran it for six years. You know, luckily I didn't leave that business owing a bunch of money or anything. We were able to sell, sell the inventory and, and, you know, walk away, but a huge lesson learned that, you know, you never know as much as you think, you know, and you should always be learning. And I'm just so grateful that I've had the success that I've had now, because I feel like if I'd have had it back in my twenties, I wouldn't have appreciated it like I do now. I wouldn't have babied it. I wouldn't have continued to learn and and adapt and you know try to continue to to change my business. And so that's the, that's the biggest thing is you know continue to learn. You don't know everything, and the market and business is always changing. So you've always got to be you know, so many people get successful and they get really complacent Mm -hmm. and you just can't do that. You just have to always be on top of it. So that's, that's probably the most important lesson I've ever learned in business. Mm, Beautiful. Well, so before we go into the two-year gap, I want to take this a little bit deeper. A few things that you said was that you thought you didn't need help, right? And that you were not willing to ask for help And finally, that you never know as much as you think you know. And so one thing that I know I've experienced and I've seen it with a lot of entrepreneurial friends and clients and so forth is sometimes you don't even know what you don't know. So you don't know. You may actually really want help. You may actually be like, oh, my God, I wish I could get some help. But you don't even know what kind of help to ask for. Right. Right. So how did you as you have evolved get over yourself in terms of realizing that you actually do need help and that you're now willing to ask for it. But I think as you grow and you try more things, you learn and figure out what you're good at. I figured out that I am a great salesperson. I have the the people skills, if you will, but the back end, you know, the bookkeeping, the taxes, you know, all the, the other things that go with owning a business, I'm not good at, you know, life, it's all about timing. And it's all about, you know, how things work out. But I did figure out that the key to me, at least the key to a real successful, scalable business is figuring out what you're good at, and going with that, and then outsourcing the rest. You know, I hear so many small business owners say, I can't afford to outsource. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, you can't afford not to outsource. Mm -hmm. If you're not an expert, at taxes or, you know, inventory or whatever it may be, then you're losing money. And also you haven't created a business, you've created a job. And there's a real difference. If your business is not scalable and you're not able to step out of it at any any given time and it still continue to run, it's not a business, it's a job. And so, I, you know, it, I think just with years of working in corporate America, along with, you know, failing at a couple of different business ventures I tried, you know, I came to realize the things I am good at and I know I can do. And then the things that I need to rely on other successful people, which comes back to another point. I always say, you know, surround yourself with the most successful people you can and your business will be successful as well. Mm, Beautiful. Well, you know, we discovered that when we came together to do our book with each other. Before we talk about the book, which I'm going to talk about right before we go to the break, let's talk about that moment between 2012 and 2014, that two year frame of time from the moment that you got the idea for Point Blank Safety to the moment in 2014 that, that the vision came into reality Overnight, like literally overnight. Right. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. You know, married to a police officer, I'm a police wife and came to realize really quickly, at least in Texas, I don't know about everywhere, but at least in Texas, police officers don't make a lot of money and they really rely on off-duty work to make ends meet. And and we were no different. You know, Michael would work off-duty jobs here and there. And and the thing was, Angel, we never knew when he was going to get an off-duty job, we never knew, you know, there was no, no pre-planning. It was so hard to, you know, I consider myself the CEO of my family first before the CEO of, of my business. And so it was really hard to plan, you know, birthdays or dinners or, or any kind of events because he would get home from a 12 hour shift and then someone would call and say, Hey, can you work off duty? And gosh, we needed the money, 
but gosh, there just went all the plans that we had, you know, already scheduled or whatever. So I said, you know, there's just got to be a better way. There's, there's got to be a way where these officers can get as much or as little off duty work as they want, you know, and it could be in a, they could know in advance 30 days or two weeks in advance when they're working, you know, how many hours they're working, when they're going to get paid, all that. And so I said, I think I can do this. I think I can, I think this is a great idea and I think I can do it. And I got a business card and I formed an LLC and that was it. Then I had to start, you know, figuring out how to get traction on this business, but don't get me wrong. I couldn't quit my job. I didn't have, you know, thousands of dollars in the bank. I was still raising two boys. My husband was a police officer, so he was never home. So it took me two years from the day I got the idea to the day the business really took off to make that happen. And there were so many times in that two years that you know, I doubted it. I said, you know, gosh, is this really how I should be spending all my time? I'm missing time with my kids. I'm missing time. You know, all, you know, my free time was, you know, 3 a.m., I guess I should say. So I just kept pushing and I just believed in the idea. I believed in myself. And so I just didn't give up. And 2014, the doorbell rang and it was FedEx and they had a package for point blank safety, which understand point blank safety didn't get packages. (laughs) (laughs) I did in a business card. And so I opened the package and it was a $1.5 million contract to use my company and our officers on a highway construction project where they were adding a lane from Dallas to Denton. So, um, wow. I get the chills when I hear that story. And speaking of which, that story and more is chronicled in our book, Wickedly Smart Women, Trusting Intuition, Taking Action and Transforming Worlds, which was a number one new release in multiple categories in multiple countries, best selling internationally. And Stacy contributed, as I said earlier, chapter 15 to the book. And we're just so grateful that you were part of that. Stacy, we're going to take a quick break. But before we go to the break, you know, I do want to fast forward and have one last little piece here about, you know, at what point did you make the decision to start the Blue Family Fund? Because, you know, that was something that happened, I'm sure, after your $1.5 million contract. When did you make that decision? It was actually 2017. You know, we were were doing really well with Point Blank and I'm a big believer in you get what you give in life. My grandfather always said that. And so we really wanted a way to pay forward our success, pay it back to first responders, our community, everything. And so, you know, Michael and I started researching different charities and we were kind of sad to find out that so many, like so little percentage of what you donate actually goes to the cause. And we just didn't want to do it that way. That's just not what, how we wanted to do it. We work hard for our money. We know everybody works hard for their money. So we decided that we would pay all the bills for the nonprofit. We wouldn't take any salaries out of the nonprofit. And so literally every dollar you donate would go to help the family of a first responder that's been hurt or injured in the, or fallen in the line of duty. It was really just a, Hey, we need to pay this forward. Mm. Beautiful. That's the right thing to do. Beautiful. Well, Wickedly Smart Women, we actually could use your help if you're enjoying the show and want us to stay on the air. We'd love to have you make a donation to www.wickedlysmartwomen.com. And also while you're at it, make a donation to the Blue Family Fund. We'll talk more about that after the break. We'd love to have you also share with your lovely lady friends and colleagues that you think might benefit from our content and also consider getting the book at wickedlysmartwomen.com. You can go right to the website and click on the book and that will take you to the book buying page. We want to say thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading, rating, and reviewing. We are welcoming thousands of thousands of downloads from all over the world. And I want to shout out this week, we might as well shout out to our listeners in Texas. We'll also shout out to our listeners, let's see, do we have any other teas in Taiwan? And to our listeners in, I'm pretty sure we have, oh, there, Tajikistan. And we will be right back with Stacey McGovern. The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by the Wealthy Life Mentor. Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? 
Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design, a life that is an extraordinary work of art? Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by women in transition. Women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. Discover your wealthy life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Stacey McGovern. She is the company owner of Point Blank Safety Services and also the founder of the Blue Family Fund. You can find out more about the Blue Family Fund, which is a nonprofit organization that provides scholarships for first responder dependents and financial aid to families of injured and fallen law enforcement officers by going to bluefamilyfund.org and be sure to press the donation button. So, Stacy, before we went to the break, we were talking about, you know, that you were inspired to pay it forward. But you also kind of dropped into the conversation that you're one of the very few nonprofit organizations that is funded by your own business. Like you put your time and your money to fund the organizational structure and operations of your nonprofit so that all the donations actually go to the intended recipients. Can you talk a little bit about what your decision-making process was to allow you to make the decision to form the nonprofit in the first place and to fund it in the second place? And what kind of things do you need to think about in your own actual money-generating business to make sure that all of those pieces of the puzzle are functional and that the funding keeps flowing properly? Wow, that's that's a lot of questions. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> You'll do fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, just as I sort of mentioned, my grandfather was a huge believer in you get what you give in life. And so as we had so much success with Point Blank, we really wanted a way to pay it forward. You know, we could have gone and bought, you know, the big house and the fancy cars and all that that stuff, but that's not what's in my heart. I wanted to help people. And, you know, I I like to say that we're changing lives, you know, one family at a time. Mm -hmm. And so many, I mean, so many stories of fallen or injured first responders get media attention Mm -hmm. and those people do get help and donations, but then there's a whole nother side of first responders that are injured or fallen that don't get any media, don't get any help. So, you know, being with a company where we, we employ over 200 police officers, you know, we learned this, you know, through our business. And so that's kind of what made the decision. Also, my my husband's a police officer and his brother is a police officer that that died of brain cancer and just just really knew that, you know, there's families out there that lose their primary breadwinner being a first responder and really, really need the the help. Mm. So that's kind of what got it all started. And then, you know, we were like, well, we started a business. What, you know, how hard could a nonprofit be? <laughs> Yeah, right. That's a lot harder than I thought it was. But anyway, uh. we just we decided to do it. And so, yeah, we do have to keep a certain level of revenue coming in on point blank to be able to fund, you know, personally the, the nonprofit. But I'll tell you what motivated me. I had a, a one-on-one meeting with a public speaker and she's pretty well known in the community. And you know, she was asking me about Blue Family Fund and I was explaining and and she, I told her that we're totally self-funded and we don't take salaries. And, and she looked at me and she said, well, that's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, now, now you've just challenged me. Now, <laughs> now, now I'm on fire and yeah, it's, it's totally sustainable and I'm going to make it happen. And so we, we, we've been doing that now for six years and, you know, it, it, it's those sort of things that, you know, just, just tell me I can't do it. And hold my beer. <laughs> well, I'll go make it happen kind of thing. So yeah, that's, that's why I continue to do it. I think it is sustainable. If you, if you want to put in the effort to make it happen, there are many other charities that are self-funded, but they're very hard to find mm-hmm. few and far between a lot of them, you know, all the money goes to a big CEO salary or a huge facility, which, you know, I understand some of them need those large facilities, but 
you know, we're making an import mm-hmm. impact more locally and more community wide. And we're pretty proud of that, honestly. Mm-hmm. And more directly. Yeah. Right. Really directly. Yeah. Beautiful. So I want to go back to the, there's two things from the front end of our, our interview here that I want to go back to. One was all of a sudden you got a $1.5 million contract <laughs> from nothing. Right. And, you know, for many people that would have actually caused them to collapse. Mm-hmm or be unable to perform or be, you know, a lot of people who have issues with money to be like, oh, I can't take this. It's, you know, like it's too much kind of thing. So how did you navigate that literal overnight affirmation from the universe that you were on the right track and that overnight influx of quite a substantial amount of money from nothing. Right. Well, and then what people don't understand is that the the contract is 300 pages. So a 300 page $1.5 million contract is very overwhelming. And, you know, you start diving into that. Well, number one, they wanted to start in two weeks. Well, I didn't even have officers at that time. So how, you know, how am I going to do that? And then number two, they wanted $5 million in insurance Well, if you don't know, $5 million in insurance is about $15,000. I didn't have $15,000. So yeah, that's the point when a lot, I feel like a lot of people would have given up, but I was just like, you know, there's no way I'm going to get this opportunity and not make it happen. It's going to change my life. It's going to change my kids' lives. It's going to change hundreds of officers' lives. I got to figure this out. And, you know, I think it's just that tenacity and that inner entrepreneurial drive that I have that just made me figure out how to make it work. Mm. You know, the great thing is that law enforcement are like a big family. So when, it, you know, when the word spread, they, they all stepped up, you know, very quickly ready to work and help us fill the needs of this contract. And then as far as the insurance, we just had a huge garage sale and we sold everything we had pretty much because you know what? $1.5 million can buy a lot of stuff. And it, in the end, it is just stuff. So, you know, we we sold everything, went back down to, to nothing and kind of started over to be able to, to buy the insurance to make it happen. So, I mean, I th- it just comes down to, you know, what are you willing to do to make it happen? It's not going to be easy. No one's going to come knock on your door and offer you $1.5 million. And if they do, there, there's a lot you're going to have to do for that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it just comes down to your mental mindset, you know, could I have just said, oh, well, you know, I don't have $15,000. It's not going to happen. I'll just go back to my, my regular job. Of course I could have, but gosh, when the bills don't matter or not that they don't matter when the bills, you know, are going to be paid. Mm. Life is so much more fun. Oh my gosh. It's like (laughs) a different world. You know, I remember the days of sweating every single bill and, you know, it's a nightmare. It's not fun. Right. When you know all that's taken care of and you can just press forward and, and live your life. It's amazing. I wish I, I wish the opportunity for everybody. Oh, that's beautiful, Stacy. Well, and you know what's really interesting, one of the things that I practice in my own life and I help my clients practice too is I call it snake medicine, right? And that's shedding what's not serving you anymore so that you can actually open up and have the room for the growth and have the room for the what's next and have the room to embody who you're becoming. And literally overnight, you became a multi-million dollar business owner and it required you to shed everything you owned in order to do that. So I think it's really appropriate. It's really appropriate. The last thing I want to ask you before we end is, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was, are you owning a business or have you made a job for yourself? And I think you and I could probably do a whole book on this or a whole yeah. a whole podcast episode on this. But if there was one thing that either you did internally, mentally, belief-wise, or that you could advise somebody who was listening, who's made their business into a job, there was one thing that you could tell them that would liberate them from that. What would that be, Stacy? Well, it seems simple, but most people don't do it. Most people 
only track the expenses of the business. I, you know, got one of those huge calendar, you know, table calendars, and I tracked how much money I generated every single day. How much money did I make for the company today? And I guarantee you do that, shoot, you do it just for a week and you'll realize quickly, oh my God, I have a job. I don't have a business because you've got to, you've got to get down to what makes me money, you know, and yes, taxes are important. Accounting is important. Social media is somewhat important. I mean, yes, all those things, but those things can make you busy for eight or nine hours and no revenue came in whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Let somebody else handle that stuff or the, the stuff that's not revenue generating and, you know, just start tracking, you know, get down to the the nitty gritty of it. How much money did my business make today? And I, I it sounds dumb, but I promise you it's eye opening. Mm-hmm. Well, and when we come to the end of the day here, a business, the, the whole purpose for a business is to generate money, right? right. It's to provide a product or service in exchange for money. And if right. the business is not making money, I like to say, say, if you're not selling, you're not serving your people, your purpose or your pocketbook. Right. So I love that you also, you know, came to the table with sales experience. And that's, you know, obviously you have that mindset. So beautiful. Well, Stacy, it has been a pleasure. And yeah. we definitely want to sell our listeners on the idea of stopping by the Blue Family Fund org to make a big fat delicious donation to Stacy awesome. and her organization so that she can help more officers and families of officers who have been injured or fallen. And I want to thank you again, Stacy, for being part of the book, Wickedly Smart Women, Trusting Intuition, Taking Action, Transforming Worlds. Please go ahead and go get that book and read more about Stacy in chapter 15. And listeners, we love feedback. Please let us know what you thought of today's show by calling into our listener line. We'll have that number for you in the show notes. Or you can send in questions or guest suggestions to listeners at wickedlysmartwomen.com. We might even give you a shout out on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Keep your ears open. And remember, you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading, and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.